it is an honor to be presenting here today. I'd like to spend the next several minutes basically kind of sharing my story and the inspiration behind the concept that my team has been working on for the past several years. So a quick slide on our core team and some of our advisors. Um, I think like Alistair said from IBHS, it's always a good idea to kind of start off a presentation with a quick survey. So quick show of hands, how many of you in the room have evacuated from fire? Okay, and how many people have actually lost their home from a fire or any other natural event? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, make that 15, okay. Sorry for your loss, that sucks. I was eight years old when I dug the charred, burned remains of what was left of my house. And it didn't feel like it at the time, but actually this event would forever change my life in the most positive way beyond what I could have ever imagined. It gave me purpose and inspiration. So just want to throw up our, our company mission so you guys can read that. So our company has been kind of focused around helping communities for nearly a decade. Play Member was accepted into the Esri Startup Business, Business Partner Program back in 2013. We have worked with communities, cities, counties, and fire departments and developed partnerships with some of the most innovative companies, large and small. Companies such as Esri, Amazon Web Services, and data providers uh, such as Google and Planet. And we also work with leading innovators such as Overwatch Arrow, who provide real-time situational awareness for, with uh, UAVs for the Forest Service and others, as well as companies like Ladris Technologies who apply machine learning to understand evacuation response. So what's unique about us is we are positioned in the field with our experience and model expertise that allows us to kind of serve the communities and our customers exactly where they are. All right. So while my story started with the 1993 Old Topanga Fire where I lost my house, the Beacon Box story kind of started with the 2018 Woolsey Fire. So today, if you guys are okay with it, I want to try to try something slightly different. So we see that's the theme of this conference so far. So bear with me as we go through this. But I'm hoping if you guys are willing to, you know, and I kind of take a leap of faith here, if you're willing to close your eyes, I want you guys, I want to kind of walk through what it's like to be on the fire scene. So if you guys are open closing your eyes, so what I want you to imagine is that I want you to imagine that you are a fire captain from Santa Rosa. You were just dispatched through mutual aid to Southern California. By the time you arrived on scene, it's the middle of the night. As you step foot out of the engine, between the smoke and darkness, you can only see 75 feet in front of you. Your eyes soon begin to water. There is a strong smell of tires burning in the driveway. There is a continuous orange glow dancing in the distance as the howling wind begins to swirl embers all around you making it difficult to gain proper depth perception. Sensory overload kicks in when you hear what mimics the sound of a jet flying overhead in an air show, while at the same time, there's a strange taste in your mouth. You're tasting the sand and the ash getting lodged in between your teeth as the wind blows. You're wearing a helmet, loose-fitting yellow, Nomex jacket and gloves that are velcroed at your side. Your boots are tightly laced and ready for action, but where do you begin? So you guys, go ahead and open your eyes. So during large events, this is the reality that firefighters face and find themselves in. Far from home, with limited information, during the Wolves of Fire, I worked alongside two engine companies, one from LA County, and another one from Santa Barbara County. And without cell service and spotty radio reception, neither crew had access to any information other than the dusty 2004 Thomas Guide in the trucks. This is a typical situation and one that recurs over and over again in these large mega fires when, when everything goes down. The next day, I watched hundreds of fire trucks line up on Pacific Coast Highway as more than a thousand homes burned above them. In the days that followed, I learned that the number one reason fire captains didn't attempt to drive up into those hills and engage is that they didn't know if they can turn their fire trucks around. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense. Given the conditions I just explained, if you were that fire captain, would you want to drive up a hill and have to back down a windy road, not being able to see very far, limited visibility, uh, uh, you know, rapidly approaching fire? Uh, all, all this makes complete sense. And it's understandably a recipe for disaster, right? So we created beacon boxes after the fire as a tool to help support emergency responders during these major events. Situation awareness is essential to responder safety, and it is required to effectively engage during a wildfire. 
Okay. So quick slide, what did that slide, or what did that fire look like? Just a quick reminder, on that same day, there was three different fires. There was a campfire, there was a hill fire, and, the Wool and the Woolsey fire. So as you can imagine, multiple repeating, uh, competing resources, a rapidly spreading fire, uh, a homeless threatened, you know, obviously adds further complexity. So after the fire, we spent the time to learn what we could do to close this information gap that we identified during the fire. How do we provide better situational awareness to those out of area responders? Countless hours were spent with local leaders and fire chiefs to understand what can be done differently and how can I help, how can my company help, and how can people I know help? What we came up with was the first speaking box prototype was installed in 2020. And since then, we have been busy, very busy, busy building networks of carefully curated maps with field data verification and input from multiple authorities, multiple departments. Some in areas after the fire providing a visual signal of what we are doing differently, Malibu, Agora Hills, and some before the fire, such as Beverly Hills and Pritchard Hill in Napa County. Let's be clear, Beacon Box, it is one of many solutions needed to combat these mega fires. It's not the end all be all, but if it can help rescue one person or save one structure, it's worth the investment, right? Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna jump into a quick video. Wildfire is now a year round threat and wildfires are bigger and more destructive than ever before. Chances that your community will survive a wildfire are in large part due to the efforts of firefighters. Their success is dependent on their ability to respond to the threat within the community. We have a lot of different tools to deal with natural disasters and emergencies and beacon boxes are an important part of that toolkit. A beacon box closes the information gap because it is providing vital information to first responders who are not familiar with the area. Beacon boxes also play an important role as it shows the community you're taking fire seriously. We're as strong as our weakest link. We need every neighbor to be involved and to be committed and to be engaged. Beacon boxes contain both digital and hard copy documents that help our first responders, particularly those who come from out of the area to help us with mutual aid. The great thing about the beacon boxes is that we were able to get funding for it through a grant, so it didn't have to come out of the city budget. Uh, we worked with beacon box and some partners to be able to put them strategically around town. Creating fire safe communities and neighborhoods takes all of us and all the tools. Jumpstart your community preparedness with a beacon box in every neighborhood. Be prepared. Beacon box. Okay, so from all these countless meetings and meetings with authorities and fire chiefs and city managers, like what did we learn? What did we have to do to be able to make this project successful? So for us, we learned that it had to be straightforward. It had to provide information in multiple formats and be secure but accessible by all first responders. So what does information look like? Let's kind of jump in this. This is an example of a community with two points of entry, as you can see from the two red boxes. There's one at the south and one at the north entrance. This is in Beverly Hills. And no matter how a firefighter enters that community, they have to basically drive by one of these boxes. Important features are identified, including the community size, aka the number of structures, validated turnaround locations, as we learned that's an important factor, and pool and hydrant locations, all designed to be easy to read and help close this information gap that we identified. In this iteration, we provide the relative risk profiles within the area, essentially making available a layer of the potential vulnerabilities of the fire moving into a structure structure configuration, providing additional information for those unfamiliar with the area. Chief Barton in Beverly Hills believes at the very least, this provides valuable information on key locations to make a stand to interrupt the domino effect. And I wanna say that again, the domino effect of a structure to structure ignition, one of the largest drivers of structure loss that we see today. So as it gets into these structures, like in Lahaina and other areas that we've seen, it goes structure to structure. And so identifying how we can interrupt that and break that contingency is really an important factor. So our maps kind of look like this, so double-sided. They have two sets of maps in each box. Um, we have fire signs on one of them, they get the general map that you see, um, and the other one, they're laminated with special lamination, um, so they're thick, easy to read at night, um, and are, are user friendly. So, to us, firefighter safety is paramount. I've never met a firefighter that doesn't want to engage and do the most amount of good for the most amount of people. 
That makes sense? If you guys ever met a firefighter who, who doesn't want to help, they always want to help. But here we provide additional layers of information highlighting areas with incredibly unsafe flame lengths. So at the very least, our goal on this map here is at least we know the engineer is going to figure out where to not park his trucks, which is obviously not going to be in those red or orange areas. So any kind of additional safety we can provide to them ahead of time is, is helpful. They're going to know this most of the time offhand, but additional validation doesn't hurt. As you can see, the beacon box is secured with a lock that is designed to be cut off. Again, I'll repeat, that's designed to be cut off. That's how we design it. Unlike a knocked box that requires a district key, we design the locks to be cut off and they're intended to be cut off during an emergency, ensuring access for anybody coming in. They can come from Arizona, Florida, if they want to make the drive, right? They can cut the lock and get in. Every fire truck has that universal key, right? And if it's a small event, there's a new different colored lock on the inside of that they can be used to re-secure on departure. So we cut the lock, let's take a look at what's inside, which you kind of saw in the video. Uh, we take a multi-format access approach to ensure information reliability. The maps are available in hard copies and rollouts, georeference digital copies available online QR codes, and georeference PDFs on USB and USB-C drives. This is resiliency in action, or what we think it is. So I want to give you a quick look at kind of what we're doing here and what some of the installations look like. And what we're shooting for is more of a long-term public safety infrastructure installation. We want these to last. They want them to be here 10, 20 years, 30 years. Um, we built them to try to you know, withstand the harshest environments. So here, here's, here's some, some different examples of how they've been installed and some diff different configurations. We have installed them in front of schools, parks, um, Canyon communities, fire stations, firewise communities, alongside existing uh, signage and infrastructure along highways. Um, one thing I want to point out here is while we installed the first box in 2020, we only started installing the rest of the boxes about 18 months ago. So over the last 18 months, we've installed 70 beacon boxes. Um, and you can see forming the kind of first of its kind network of information distribution stations for out of air, out of air firefighters. The feedback coming in from city officials has been overwhelmingly positive. Beacon boxes have become a signal to the residents that continuing investments are being made to protect them, which, which is huge. So as a company, we are heavily invested in growing and maturing our production line. However, we need everybody in this room, we need all your help to help identify communities and funding opportunities to benefit and extend this network throughout the state and beyond. Those are our goals. We think they can do a lot of good for a lot of people, but they gotta be out there and it, they are infrastructure, so it takes a while to get them up installed and correctly configured and permitted. So we need your help. So again, this on our team, this is me, um, open to questions. I appreciate all your time and thank you so much for listening to my story. I have to use the mic so it goes in the recording. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about the infrastructure that needs to be in place for the beacon box to be installed. Do you provide these tensions? Um, or you know the posts, or it can go say on the same pad where there is like a um, multi-unit housing mailbox. What do you need from the municipality? Great, that's a, good, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times, potentially, we have install kits and different varieties of installation kits that we that we sell. Um, they can be mounted on a wall, which you can see here. They can be mounted on utility poles, which they have. They can be mounted on light poles. They can mount on pretty much any kind of existing infrastructure. Some. Uh, like communities like Gore Hills, they wanted all brand new poles, so they got all brand new poles put in, which is kind of similar to like a no parking sign that they went in on. And then some communities like Beverly Hills wanted on an existing infrastructure, um, like light poles. So it depends on the city, and then we find that they're all different. Um, our goal to, as we place them, we use a lot of machine learning to help us identify where you're gonna get the highest traffic volumes of fire trucks driving through. So we want, we, we try to place them in those corridors. So, so they're seen. We can't guarantee they're gonna open them, but that's the idea is that, that they see them, that they're in their face, and ho hopefully open one. Thank you. Any other questions? Does anybody not like the idea? Like the idea? Looking for feedback here. Thanks for your presentation, Shay. I don't know if you mentioned the, your weather station idea. I was. No, I did not. You did not. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you. So in Beverly Hills in year two, we're putting fully automated weather stations with inside the boxes. And the idea is that potentially we're getting localized information at the fire scene of where the sh they're being threatened. So idea as these start going out, we're rolling out these weather stations, potentially uh, organizations like Cal Fire, when, you know, in some of the companies they work with, they run the modeling, and potentially pull this weather information out to get localized weather, which is obviously a big problem when you're doing predictive analysis. Um, there's a big gap um, in information and not being able to get that localized weather. So 
we're trying to help, you know, kind of bridge those gaps. We're learning not everybody's ready for fully automated, you know, uh, IoT solution with fully automated sensors, but um, we've had customers request like gunshot sensors to weather stations to a whole bunch of other different things that they can use to check and count cars um, that we're considering um, based on some of the feedback that, we, that we've gotten. Any other questions? Hi, I support several innovation competitions in Oregon, so that's where my brain is at right now. Can you tell us about how your prototype or design has changed, like once you started installing them, or was it just ready to go and kind of perfect from the day one? That's a great question. So that first box we put in, we actually put in three different boxes with three different types. Um, what we found was um, they were installed in Malibu in a coastal environment. We had some boxes that completely disintegrated in less than six months, which was actually really mind blowing because they're galvanized, supposed to be weather resistant, but they were clearly not. Um, we also had flash drives that actually completely disintegrated as well. So we had to move to a much more expensive, like fully stainless steel flash drive that we were working on testing. And right now we, you know, we've had we're on year two of testing, so we're looking to see how long they're going to last and how long we need to update the interval. But we don't know that yet. But we're constantly looking to get metrics on. Uh, our goal is to put in infrastructure when if someone goes to open, we want to work. So we're trying to find the best ways we can do that. But that's a great question. So yeah, we've changed a lot, everything from like design to construction to water tightness to breathability, um, all the way into like look and feel of, of, of the product from different feedback from different departments. Thank you, Shay, for sharing your story and, and uh, that story of your experience inspiring, helping all of us in preparedness, right, in talking more about preparedness. And, um, and I was having a little hard time hearing back here, so you may or may not have already um, shared this, but as far as updating the information over time, how, how does that work? Because things change, development change, um, you know, situations change uh, in, in communities over time. How often does that get updated? And, um, and how do the firefighters that are coming into new um, communities that are not their community, how do they know these boxes exist or to look for them? And, and again, I apologize if you already answered that and I just didn't hear it. Thank no, you. Great, all great questions haven't been answered yet. So I'll, I'll start backwards on that. In terms of like visibility, we're working on trying to get these products um, into like uh, um, existing institutions out there like Tablet Command and you know, Watch Duty and different apps that can potentially locate these boxes. Um, so there's that aspect of your question. In terms of, remind me the first part of your question. You asked about the, so I'll go, sorry, thank you. Uh, update information. So we recommend a three to five year update interval. Um, obviously like City of Malibu where they don't have any developments in certain areas, they're not changing for five years because they pretty much have very strict permits. Like they're at a five year interval, but other cities like Agoura Hills, Beverly Hills, they're a three year update interval. And so we come and do a full reprint and update of all the information. Once the information is pretty much curated and dialed in and refined and validated. Um, updating just comes, if it's, it's just, you know, it's, if it's a solid system of record and a solid database, it's relatively, the updates are relatively simple. Um, it's just, you know, getting to that point is what, what kind of what our biggest stretch. And a real quick question, in terms of price, I want to give you a quick, we charge about 3950 for these, which people think are steep at first, but you realize like this is public safety infrastructure built to last. Like some of the first boxes we put in that allowed us to get it cheaper, they disintegrated, they fell apart. So. We try to, like, as a company, like, we are not a nonprofit, but this is our one solution. We're trying to put at the bare bottom price to get out there because we think it has an impact. This is our one way of giving back as a company. We are a for-profit company, and we do make a profit on a lot of our other products, um, which I didn't really talk about today. But at the end of the day, we want to use this as our opportunity to give back. So at the end of the day, we're trying to give as cheap as possible. But again, it, it is infrastructure, and it's got to last. The $3,950, $3,950. But that includes... All the maps curated, uh, basically detailed field uh, maps and iPads that go out that you can use to validate, collect hydrants, um, validate data, mark up anything you want to mark up, and that gets pulled into the database and then curated and then run through the local department to validate what they want and don't want on the maps, which is an important aspect of, of, of this whole process. We spent years working with different, crawl different departments, getting feedback and, 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 and input to find out what is the best solution that they're all looking for. Shay. What's the largest incident that you've had the opportunity to test the product on? Again, we started installing last year, so there hasn't been any fires yet, so zero. So we have a 0% success rate, to be clear on that. Yeah. Although, um, if, I can, if I can just say that I just took um, Cal Fire's Mike Wink out there to look at it, because he works a lot in Lake County, and I'm like, okay, no, you got to see this thing before she leaves with it. Um, Rarely in this work, so often um, the way that we design our systems for mega fires doesn't really take into account people who've experienced them. Um, it, it's not, that's not on purpose, it just happens. 
It's why I like half this room is survivors, right? Because that's where you should start. It's the best research and development on the planet. And then you, you reverse engineer. That's how it should be. This is one of those products that was reverse engineered right down to the lamination, right down to the solar light, right down to the name of it, right down to how it is actually deployed. And this was a problem that was in my head for years since I sat with Reva Feldman from City of Malibu in like 2019, about a year after the Woolsey, I'm sorry, uh, 2019, a year after the Woolsey fire. And all these people that I worked with um, who were um, citizens of Malibu were super, super angry with her because they thought that she had burned down their homes because they saw fire trucks on Zuma Beach. But what they forgot was that people want their fathers and their mothers to come home from fighting a fire. So that means you can't send people up into Malibu Canyon with no situational awareness at all and expect that their two-way radios are going to work because they're not and that their cell phones are gonna work because they're not, that there's going to be Wi-Fi because there won't be. And so how is it that you get those people home? That matters more than someone's home. That's the reality of it. So for me, coming across this a couple of months ago, it just solved just this huge problem that I had been worried about since 2019, since I sat down with Reva and really understood the problem. And when I learned that Reva actually was part of your consulting team, I was like, well, of course, that makes perfect sense. So for me, even though he, even, you have a 0% success rate, from everything I know in my six years of working in Megafire, to me, it's 100%. And so I'm super grateful.